my topic that I proposed to the wonderful Paul Katz for today's cello chat was fun and games. Um, and that's pretty much the way I roll when I practice. Um, hi, Hayden! And Amy Anwar. Hi, Amy. Do I know you? You look sort of familiar. Uh, Samir Sko, yay! Um, Hayden, I'm assuming that you're also in JP. And Samir, <laughs> I assume that you're in Shaker Heights. Um, so, hi, Nancy. Um, so, everybody, it's, it's great to... It's great to know that we are connecting and, you know, in this kind of amazingly bizarre, crazy time. Um, hi, Will Hayes. Amy Pirtle? Oh my gosh, Amy Pirtle. You have a new last name. Oh dear, we do have to talk. Okay, quite. Um, so, um, Will Hayes is in Albany. Hi, Will. Alice Sewell. Hi, Alice. Um, so here I am, and I'm supposed to talk about fun and games with the practicing the cello, and yet all I want to do is just say hi to everybody. Uh, so basically, um, my biggest games that I like to play have to do with um, how I break down passages and repertoire, also how I do my warm-ups, and, um, and it all for me comes down to the metronome, because I'm, a, I'm what I ca like to call a metronomaholic, which means that I can't practice for very long without getting out. Rachel, oh my gosh, hi. Without getting out a metronome. Uh, and it would be great if I had a metronome handy. And of course I do not, so I'll have to get up an app on my phone. So let me see if I can do that. If any of you guys have any questions about anything, uh, that would be great. Well, wow, that's ironic. I just got a text from Gwen Krosnick, a great cellist. Gina from Brooklyn. Hi, Gina. Okay, so I'm going to get out a metronome app. I know, it's bad. For somebody who's addicted to the metronome, to not have a metronome app installed on their phone, something really wrong with that, right? Yeah. You know what it is? I just can't decide. So metronome, I'm going to just say metronome at 69. Should be 60 probably, but I do have a problem with rushing, so I might as well just do 69. Good, that's a good tempo. Okay, we'll just have it on, on call there. Um, hi, Paul Katz. I'm assuming you're out um, with that beautiful view north of Boston. Uh, I am here with my, my cello and in my apartment in uh, Boston in an area called Jamaica Plain. And I'm enjoying it uh, this day to day because I have very nice large windows and there's beautiful sunny blue skies. So despite the isolation that we're all feeling, um, at least if you have a window where you can look out, that's really something. Uh, actually, I'm one of those practicers who sometimes avoids rooms with windows because <laughs> I get a little distracted. Uh, and other times I really find that I, I, I really seek out a, a way to look out on something beautiful. I remember uh, one of my very favorite vacation experiences was one where I went with a, a couple of friends and we we rented a cabin in the woods and uh, you know I brought my cello along and I thought why am I doing this I don't even know I'm going on vacation I should take a break from, from practicing and what ended up happening is that I spent time with the cello for anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours every day uh, and I did hadn't brought any music along with me <laughs> But I had the metronome and I had the cello and so I had to do, I did a lot of scales and I remember just sort of like trying to find a beautiful place to to sit with a view in the cabin and look out on the woods and just play. So I either was playing scales or arpeggios, or, but the other things I had to play were only the things that I had memorized. And so, you know, some concertos, some Bach, a um, couple of popper etudes. Is that bad that I have popper etudes memorized? Wow. Maybe not. Carlos. Oh, Carlos. Tu tienes mi corazón. Oh, my gosh. Roberta's watching the birds. I like it. Any new cello accessories or gadgets or apps that you're loving? Oh, Amy Pirtle. <laughs> Amy Pirtle, I, I don't really have any cello accessories that I'm using. Why is it that I'm talking or trying to talk in an English accent? Um, I have, of course, my blingy mute. 
It's got Swarovski crystals and my blingy fine tuner. Um, other than that, uh, it's quite the thing in Boston, uh, as it is throughout the world, but it's almost, I'd say, two-thirds of my students, the Borromeo Quartet, and many other members of the faculty all play and perform from iPads. So many of them, you know, have the fancy pedals. Uh, the Borromeo Quartet, in fact, uh, my new colleagues here at the New England Conservatory, and I've so enjoyed falling in love with each member of that group. Um, they are very much into performing from the score. And, oh, Robert Maya says he has a metronome that he finds isn't loud enough. Okay, so hey, Robert, here's the deal. I actually own four mini PA systems. And they're, they're fantastic. I just use, and I plug the metronome into them. So, of course, most of the time, oh, tu tienes mi corazón, Carlos, Carlitos, um, te amo, tu tienes mi corazón. Sorry about that, old friend. Um, so, I, of course, most of my activity these days in my life is coaching chamber music groups. So, when you use a metronome for a chamber music group, which I do because I'm addicted to the metronome, you, I find it's best to uh, amplify it. And uh, when I was a member of a professional quartet, which I did for like 32 years, um, I just brought in one, I, I, I've always fooled around on electric guitar, I just brought in one of my guitar amps and plugged the metronome into it. And that way we could have it on loud enough so that we could all hear it and play whatever volume we wanted to. And I have found myself doing that uh, with these. Now, the Bluetooth speakers are great. Um, this, for quartet sometimes, I, uh, there's only one that I've found so far that I think is loud enough. These PA systems get really loud, and they're not much bigger than a Bluetooth uh, speaker. They're usually a lot heavier, actually, but um, they work great. So, uh, yeah, you can get very loud, and anytime you play anything that's in a tempo above, like, 126, like 132 and over, uh, it feels like you're going clubbing because it sounds... A little bit like you know it should be some sort of cool dance music um, do I have trouble with a peg that slips um, Roberta hi Roberta Elizabeth Mausch I, I do not have problems with that as of late um, I've been playing on this cello for about 17 or 18 years now and and uh, it, it's been great it hasn't I haven't had problems with that I think occasionally when I'm traveling and I go to a strange climate and at first maybe the cello may be a little feisty uh, but I also have you know the fine tuners on each string I have one of those wonderful light um, tail pieces so I I don't I have found that I didn't need to get the fancy uh, tuners that have like the gears in them I grew up <laughs> Playing a cello that had been uh, passed down to me, it was my aunt's cello, and it was set up like, you know, a double bass where they have the mechanical uh, tuner things up here, or like a, a guitar or a double bass, and so I, I, I always feel like when I finally switched to cellos that didn't have that, I didn't know what I was doing, so uh, I have to, um, have to make sure that I have pegs at work because I'm not such a great tuner. Um, here's another question. Do you have any tips for students learning how to score study for the first time? Alice you. Alice you. OMC. Of course I do. Of course I do. So I definitely believe in score study. Um, I have a little handout that I use with my students. Um, and I have like six things on this handout for people to do in their score study. Um, I just need to find it here and I bet it's like the first thing in the the book it sure is so the first thing that I have students do and in fact I, I go through periods where I get really uh, strict about them doing the type of score study that I want because I feel like if they unify the way they study the score it might really help in their rehearsal process so for young students old students I do the same thing I do the same myself these th three things on top here score study I hope it looks okay the first thing is I get the score and I look and I tell the students to look for any place they have the same rhythm as another voice and mark it into their part. The next thing I look for is any place where there's a silence, where nobody in the group is playing. And when that occurs, those grand pauses or silences, I ask people to circle them because it takes a certain mentality to feel rhythmic energy or to really sustain a character during silence. And then finally I say write in rhythmic cues. And if it's someone who has a melody, I 
I recommend writing a, another voice that has a small rhythmic subdivision. Uh, if you are playing uh, an accompanimental figure, write in a bar or so of the melody's rhythm. Um, and those are the three basic things that I recommend everybody do for score study. So, Alice, you may remember from, I don't know however long ago, uh, the, the first one that is called Same Rhythm Buddies, and the second is Circle All Silence, and the third is Write in Rhythmic Cues. And those three things I really recommend for everybody to do. Uh, and then, of course, for me, the next thing that I'll do is I'll, I usually this point, if I'm playing something written, let's say, before 19... 04 <laughs> is I'll probably do a harmonic analysis and a sonata allegro movement of the uh, development. Uh, for me, I'm so old now that certain harmonies mean something to me. So if I see that it's like going from E flat major to G minor to whatever, I get kind of excited about how I might possibly approach coloring sound. Um, I also look at the tessitura of the group. So that has to do with the range or register in which the group is playing. Um, I'm going on and on about this because I so believe in it. Um, that being said, uh, I, I think I've mentioned and when Amy was asking about the gadgets, uh, not only do the Borromeo Quartet members play off of iPads, they play off of scores. And I think, I'm not sure if all of them, but at least some of the members will play off of manuscripts whenever possible. Um, when you play off of a score, of course, you have all the parts in front of you, so maybe you do score study a little differently. I still recommend for pianists or people who are playing off of scores that they highlight or they put arrows or circle areas with the same issues that I talked about if you're writing into a part with just a single line. So find your same rhythm buddies. If you're a pianist and your left hand is being doubled by another voice, I think it's good for you to be very aware of that. So you're always understanding who you're trying to send your energy to and who you're trying to receive energy from. Um, and the circling all silence, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going on and on and on. I have a wolf that, that read pros and cons of adding something for cello for that. Open. Oh, hi Gina, I have never used a wolf eliminator. Uh, the closest thing I've ever come is I have this torch mute. I've had, fortunately, because it has $40 of Swarovski crystals, I've had it for like a decade. I used to lose a mute every three months. And it, it's the one with the two holes. And for some reason, it pinches my, it's one of these, just very simple, with all these crystals on the top. And mine's missing a few, so it kind of looks cool. It's kind of like sort of blingy in a hip hop sort of way. Uh, but I find that when I put it on the strings, as, and I put it in a certain position, it pinches and I get it like, let's say, right about halfway in between. It pinches the strings just enough that it can help with uh, eliminating at least my, my F wolf somewhat on the G string. This cello is a little feisty about that particular note on the G string. Um, but I've never used any of the attachments on the cello itself. Oh my gosh, Michelle Katz, hi! The sun has gone to bed, and so must I. I remember when you were like a little kid, and you were sitting on the steps, stairs, in your house, and you sang that for me. Yeah. And you even took that little breath right where the actress from the movie does. To bed, and so... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Lucas. Hi, Lucas Goodman. Hayden, how does one stay motivated to practice when we're in isolation? I don't have performance scheduled and don't... Okay. Hayden, this is such a good question. And this is sort of ironic because my life has changed so much. I have, I'm performing much less than I used to, say, four or five years ago. And so practicing for me is something I don't do all that regularly. I do it right when I... Like, let's say I have a concert in a few weeks and I'm going to start rehearsing. I start practicing it in earnest at least a week before my first rehearsal. So usually a few weeks before the concert. But I have been finding myself practicing during this time. For me, it's been really good for my soul. It's also good to like just move and play. Um, also, Hayden, maybe playing some of the games that um, I was talking about with the metronome, um, you know, it can also help you for getting ready to play chamber music, I think. You know, so let me show you one of the metronome games. I think I really believe in um, vibratos. Oh, there's just too much to talk about. Let me get to the metronome for a second, okay? So here I've got it on uh, 69. And so this is the way I've been starting out my day. I'll play long tones. 
And, you know, I'll just try to divide the bob evenly. So three, four. You can't see my bow, can you? See? I didn't position this very well. I thought I had. Um, here, I'll do it this way. I know this looks a little weird. So I position two, two, three, four. And I always leave more bow for the bow change. So people say dividing it up evenly, and I don't do that. So let's say I'm, I'm dividing it up into a unit of four. The first three beats are going to be like that, but the fourth beat may have half as much additional bow. That's what I, I try to do to save to really be able to uh, kind of create that illusion of a legato bow change, okay? So I've been doing that. And then the first thing I do, I do it on each string, and up on a down bow, and then I go back to the C string, and now I do this on off beats. One, two, three, four. just like trying to tap you in the face I just got a message on my iPad so I was turning it off so the metronome is the first thing I get out and then if I do scales and rhythms which I pretty much always do I usually do slow uh, harmonic minor scales three octaves in triplets and um, Sam Brinkley hi Mary what kinds of mantras have you held on to during times where you felt inadequate and sure of yourself as a musician? Well, okay. Um, first of all, I think anything that's fun for you. Uh, so this is fun for me. These metronome games, I'm going to turn this off. But Hayden, I don't know if that's weird, but there's with I know um, for Hayden talking about just trying to be motivated and find things to do without knowing what our next performance goal is, or even when we're going to have a rehearsal and interact with other musicians. Um, I'm starting to also look into technology. So, <laughs> and I'm like 58 physically, mentally not quite that old. Um, but, so I'm, I've got a project. I'm going to try to use some apps, uh, GarageBand for one thing I'm going to do, and this other app, Acapella, and I know there's some others as well uh, that are similar to those two apps where you record a line and then re and then on another track record another one and you sync them up. Um, I'm interested in trying to find ways to use those apps. Of course, people have been doing a lot in other mediums of music and pop music, for example, and doing arrangements. Um, but this is the time to, to, to maybe experiment with that kind of thing. Hayden, I would love to see you playing the Papa Requiem, all three parts. You know, and find what on the acapella you can do like I think a minute of music or something like that without having to pay the monthly fee. So you could do a minute at a time as a project, you know, so just do like four phrases or something and see if you can do all three parts. That could be really fun. And I would really want to see it. So if you do it, please send it to me. Okay. Um, also, I'm thinking I'm going to try to do it with a Mozart quartet movement. I'm thinking of doing the opening of the distance, for example and trying to play all the parts on my cello because I remember when I was a young person <laughs> five million years ago, um, my first obsession, Josh McClendon, hi Josh, are you in Michigan? Okay. Um, and I remember 5,000 years ago falling in love and becoming obsessed with the Schubert cello quintet, right? Is there anything better piece to be obsessed with? There aren't many. That's a really good one. And I went home, my hometown was at Olympia, Washington. There weren't a lot of other musicians that I knew around that I could play chamber music with and I was just falling in love with it. So I didn't even think about ways to reach out to people. Remember, this is before the internet. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I got my little cheap, uh, you know, ghetto blaster and my other cassette player and I started recording different lines of the opening of the Schubert cello quintet and then trying to record over so I do a line and then another line and then I record with those two lines and it ended up sounding a little fuzzy because once you get like five 
tracks on a bad cassette player. Not so good. But I learned a lot about just really listening. Uh, I did this without headphones, too. Anyway, it was really fun. Oh, okay, another question. Samir Sko, is it possible to incorporate your l bad exercise in practicing by yourself? How would you do this? Okay, this is a great question. Hi, Katie! Hi! Oh, wow, these are good questions. Hi, William Saw. William Saw, where are you? West Virginia? Did you say your parents? Never mind. Anyway. Um, Matthew, hi! And Norm Fisher. Oh my gosh. Norm Fisher? Mwah! Hi! Ten Ten! Mwah! Joanna? Hi, Joanna. You know, 18 years ago. Whoa! Joanna, that's so cool. Hi, Joanna. Um, anyway, Joanna, I love you. You remember that song? It's cool in the game. Okay, I'm old. Remember, I'm old. Um, you know, classic pop music. Uh, what was I talking about? Whoa, 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 whoa. Elbad, Samirsko. All right, so Elbad are the initials for an exercise called Live, Breathe, and Die, which sounds pretty morbid. Uh, but it's, it's actually uh, a technique that uh, the quartet I was in, we started, we, we, we really learned it from uh, Donald Weilerstein who asked us in a coaching to play a phrase really going with one person. So visually connecting, orally, totally listening to that one person, and whoever was the main person really trying to show and generously give direction to your collaborators about what you want to do with the phrase. Um, so I remember, Samir, when I first started doing that, um, it was incredible for me because I, I felt... Like, I just listened better when I was up visually when I played chamber music. I still feel that way. Um, and I do remember, Samir, like, doing, like, the score study because I was so into, you know, chamber music. I'd gone completely nuts, got obsessed with it. I remember doing the score study and, like, with practicing with the mirror, trying to look in the right direction of the people that I had the same rhythm with. So that was one thing that I tried to do. And, you know, I know that right now we're not able to look forward to our next rehearsal. But we can remember what it was like. Samir Sko, for example, Samir Apt is in a great quartet here at NEC. It's been such a joy to work with this quartet. They did the, the entire K-428 and they did such beautiful things with it. And they were just getting started on Schumann's Opus 41, number three, the A major Clara Quartet. And anyhow, and then um, all this stuff happened and we had to isolate, sequester ourselves. Um, not so conducive to chamber music rehearsal. Um, so I think Samirsko, for example, if you're like even thinking like working on the slow movement of the, of the Schumann, for example, you know, and really thinking about how, when it is that you have to play your part out to the front and cue the audience, when it is you really have to be there with a line totally for someone playing a melody, when you have to really be connected to your same rhythm buddy. And you can remember from your perspective in the group what it was like to play with each person. And try to do that. You could even do it with, gosh, with the iPad. <laughs> I don't have a big mirror set up in my place. I'd probably have to. But that I remember practicing that way. I don't know if that's helpful or not, Samir Sko, but it would be fun to do. Um, let me see, are there any questions? Oh, Chen, hi, Bougie. Um, is it possible, oh, El bad. There was something about career building advice post-conservatory. Hi, Chris Cortez. Hi, also a familiar name. Um, oh my gosh. There's a question in Spanish. My Spanish is not so good. Uh, yo hablo muy poquito. Ejercicios para mantener el arco paralelo al puente. What's puente? Point. What's paralelo? Oh, I'm so sorry. Lo siento mucho. I don't remember what that means. Oh my gosh. Oh, Marciero, is there any way you could um, write that in English? Lo siento mucho. That's totally right. Young hey. Doy buchi. I just said I'm sorry in four languages. Um... At any rate, uh, I think post-conservatory career advice 
you know, I'm really good at giving people advice when they don't ask for it. So I might as well give it a shot <laughs> since you're asking, um, Chris. Um, it depends on what you want to do with your music. Um, you know, I think that um, I remember when I was getting ready to be done with college, I was committed to a, to a group that I knew we were going to work together professionally. So it was almost like I'd gotten married during college to three other players and we formed a string quartet and, and it was sort of an unsaid thing uh, that we would be working together because we were getting grants and looking for the right place for us to live and teach and uh, took us to Ohio and then eventually to Cleveland. Um, but when I'm talking to students now, I, I, I mean, I remember when I started my position here at the New England Conservatory as the chair of chamber music, I had a lot of second year grad students saying, you know, Mary, I love chamber music and I'm graduating and I'm not in a group and I don't know what to do. And, um, you know, there's a lot you can do. So there's more opportunities to have, if you're not in isolation, that is, in social distancing, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to do freelance chamber music playing. And I believe in a way that is more conducive to actually making a decent living more than it was, let's say, even 20 years ago. Uh, I feel like the idea of the, there's, the, there's a new term, it's very hip, called the portfolio musician, which recently I was, I became aware of. Um, and I think that has to do with kind of, you know, feeling like you are well-versed in doing lots of different things. And, you know, I, it's sort of interesting because I remember when we build our careers, you know, we base it a lot on role models. Uh, when, when I was graduating college, I was in a string quartet, and, and we wanted to be like our teachers. We wanted to be like the Cleveland Quartet. We wanted to be, be able to play in the beautiful way that they did, and we also had lots of ambitions in terms of we wanted to have a residency and teach somewhere regularly. We wanted to record. We wanted to perform. We wanted, you know, we blah, blah, blah. We had things we wanted to do. Um, and I feel like in the last even 10 years or so, more and more people are not necessarily having to commit to playing in a professional ensemble. Oh, Maricera, thank you. Cello Bull Peril is the bridge. Oh, you know, I'll talk about it more, but let me finish talking about this career advice, if that's okay. Um, hi, Timothy Pig. How you doing? I'm assuming you're not far. You're in Boston, right, Tim? Anyway. Um... So I feel like there are so many things that one can do. Let's say that you want, you know that you're going to need to do lots of different things to be able to pay your bills. Um, and you know, it's just starting out with some basic questions. Like make a three and a five and a 10 year plan and ask yourself some practical questions. Where do I want to live? What are some of my artistic goals? If it's, Stuff by yourself? Oh, I want to be able to play all the unaccompanied Bach for violin on the cello by the time I'm five years from now. <laughs> Which, by the way, I don't want to do, but it might be a goal for somebody. Um, and then you need to figure out a way to make that happen. If you decide, well, I'm currently living in a big city, but I'd really like to live closer to my family and they're way over here, then, you know, it's funny you may feel like, well, there's nothing for me to do there. But if you, if that's really part of your goal, you will find ways to make that happen. So you need to sort of decide what your goals are personally, professionally, artistically, and see if you can get them all to align. Now, somehow I was a member of a group and I knew that I wanted to be in chamber music from the time I was 19. I knew that by the time I was a sophomore in college, I fell in love. I caught the bug and boy, there's a lot of gray. Sorry, just saw scary. Um, didn't have that when I was a sophomore in college. Um, and I remember thinking, well, gosh, you know, maybe I could try to get a position in an orchestra and just play a lot of chamber music with my friends from the orchestra. By the time I was a junior, I thought, no, I'm really more interested in maybe getting a teaching position in the liberal arts college and playing chamber music with the other faculty members. And said, Jared Balance, whoa, hi, Jared. Hanbin, hi. Where are you, Hanbin? Are you in Belgium? Anyway, hi Hanbin. Um, so I feel like um, kind of knowing, you know, a little bit about what your three-year 
and then your five year and your 10 year. And you know, you can sort of like, I remember doing this plan with my quartet when we were just finishing, we had just moved to Cleveland. So we were two years out of college. We actually went to college to study together. Um, and we did this plan and somebody facilitated it for us. It's Marsha Ferrito. And we discovered that we, there were many similar goals that we had personally and many that were so different. And a lot of the personal ones kind of didn't work for everybody. <laughs> I remember one member of the group was like, by the time ten, five years from now, they wanted to be married and have children. And that person never got married and didn't have children. Um, and then other people had different things. I, you know, some people wanted to be making a certain amount of money. Some people wanted to record the Beethoven Quartet. Somebody else wanted to, you know, um, develop a music festival or, and it's funny the things in those plans that came true for all of us. Um, and when I've done this, this, um, this exercise with students, um, you know, it's a little scary, but at least it gets you thinking. So if you're asking Chris about post-conservatory career advice, you know, start with the basics. I mean, so if I'm talking to a student at the New England Conservatory that's a second-year grad student, uh, if they're a senior, I'll say, oh, study some more because now's the time. You know, for what we do, you need to keep working. And so if you found a teacher or you're interested in working with a teacher that really inspires you, I think that's what you should do. If you're a second year master's student and you feel like you don't want to be in school anymore, then decide where you want to live and try to do what you want to do. Um, I've, there's been a lot of graduates, or and, and they st some of them started doing it during their second year of grad school here in Boston, who've started chamber music series sort of for a cause or just to facilitate them being able to collaborate with friends and create concert events. And some of these concert events sound amazing. You know, uh, Thomas Cooper started for Mata, which is kind of these late night concert experiences. And he set them up and it sounds fantastic. And um, you know, Dan Orson, I call him Dorsonator. He set up a series of chamber music concerts here in Jamaica Plain. Uh, so they're just kind of, you know, and, and uh, the other thing is uh, people starting these sort of chamber music consortiums with a cause. Um, you know, Kim Kashkashian with her music for food. That's very inspiring. Uh, it brings people together where the music sometimes is just an excuse to like really do something to help the community, something that Kim really believes in, which is feeding people. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, going to those concerts is a very meaningful experience. Uh, and uh, I know of, of former student and now wonderful colleague Molly Carr who started Project Music Heals Us, uh, wanting to do residency activities where the music could be taken to people where it could really enhance their lives, um, whether it's in a senior living center or in, in a prison system. Um, anyhow, if you want to do chamber music and you don't have a quartet or a trio or a group that's all set to go, there are ways you can do it. If you build it, they will come. If that's not what you want to do, if you want to find other things, if you want to focus more on teaching, you can also focus on that. Um, Chris, I'm so sorry I've gone off on this for too long. I apologize. Maybe I should go back to Marciera's question about the parallel to the, the bridge, right? Wait, what did you get? Cello will parallel bridge. Thank you so, Marciera. Boy, that is a great name. Marciera Torre de la Rosa. Rosa, Rosa. okay. So, of course, my camera's funky, but I'm afraid if I move it, it'll tip over. Um, so parallel to the bridge, you know, I feel like, I feel like it was hard for me at first to practice knowing if my, my bow was, um, oh, sure, Chris. Chris, where are you right now? Are you, in, I feel like I know you. Where did I meet you? Did I meet you in like Virginia or something? Or did I meet you? Anyway, sorry. Um, so about the bow being parallel to the bridge. I remember when I first became obsessed with the bow and the bow being parallel to the bridge was definitely when I was an undergraduate because I don't feel like I really broke down my technique as much as I did as when I went to college. Um, and I, for me, I had to start out with a mirror. I had to literally see what it looked like 
as best I could. So in the practice rooms, I did my undergrad in Indiana University, and they had those they had long mirrors in most of the practice rooms. And I remember just watching my bow, and oh my gosh, Mara! Hi, Mara McLean. Um, I remember watching my bow, and after a while, I could sort of by a combination of looking in the mirror at what was happening with my bow, I started to memorize what it looked like from my perspective here. So that I didn't have to look in the mirror, I could look down at it. And I could see it was moving around. And then after a while you can also, you get more attuned to the other aspects, a uh, combination of things that we do to get a good sound or the sound that we're imagining that we want to create. Um, the 3.5 things I call it. So it's where you put the bow, contact point, how much weight or pressure you use, how fast you move the bow. Hi, Mara. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, which I've become more obsessed with probably in the last decade or so, is the angle of the hair and also how much which plane angle we're thinking about too, which string. Uh, because you know how sometimes if you're doing like a quick fast. Something like that, you might actually be thinking more of a D string plane than an A, D, A, D. So you want to be something in the middle because you're doing this quick motion between the strings. Anyway, so those 3.5 things, the combination of those things is what we use to change the energy of the tone. And um, so you start to hear, you know, because the moving away from the bridge, the contact point, it's not just the contact point. It's also, so if I'm maintaining pretty much the same even weight or pressure, and I let the bow move up towards the fingerboard, I can hear, I don't know if you can hear it there, but I can hear here, here. <laughs> I can tell that I'm losing some of that edge of that brighter overtone. If I get closer to the bridge with the same weight or pressure, oh, you can't see, sorry. So I'm starting out in the middle, and you're maintaining it then. I have to, I can hear that I have to do something to address the string to make it keep the connection. Because as it gets tighter closer to the bridge, I have to do stuff, kind of sense it with the cushions or the, the knuckles, very sensitively with the fingers itself. Not so much just with the arm, but with the fingers and how it's kind of the stick, whatever we do with the stick is gonna lead what we do with the hair. So this may seem weird, but it starts up, it started out as a visual. I just had to literally watch to see when my bow was doing that, because I couldn't tell. Then after a while, I could start to see it from this perspective, looking down at my bow from where I'm playing. Then I could start to hear it, and I would start to start to understand that, oh, I'm suddenly moving the bow really fast and sending to go like that because my arm's going like that. Anyway, so it's a strange combination of many things. I think it started out for me as a visual one with the mirror, then a visual watching here. Then it became aural. I list, oh, can't see. I'm pointing to my ear. It became an aural thing where I could actually hear when my bow was not staying parallel. And you know, one of the things that was amazing for me uh, to control the bow was playing very steady bass lines. Uh, you know, if you're playing Debussy Quartet, and, and you start thinking about how is that pedal going to enhance that beautiful lullaby. <laughs> Don't listen to me sing it, because I ain't beautiful when I sang it. Um, but maybe you're changing it. Because on top of that pedal, maybe the harmony's changing. It's creating a certain kind of wonderful tension. Um, and that's when I had to really, I was realizing like, boy, if I do not keep my bow straight and really address that, keeping in that groove, I can hear it and I can't play a good pedal. I can't play a good bass line. Um, what's another one? Uh, Another one. 
Um, but so then if you practice imagining the melody and imagining how you uh, you can feel it might be shaped by someone and maybe to do that you have to play it yourself so maybe you have to do that to really sort of understand what you might want to do with the bass line but then it's funny, bass lines, yeah, even more than melodies. Somehow the bass lines really help me to understand better about my technique and contact point and keeping in the groove and directing the sound and listening for how I wanted to shape that line. Um, a lot of stuff. Any other questiones, folks? Um, I said I was going to talk about games, but I feel like I've just been going off on so many different tangents. I'm almost out of time. Oh, I'm just going to see who this is in case... It's Thomas Barth telling me what to do. It might be. Or somebody saying, you know, I really wanted you to talk about this, and you're not doing it, so now I'm upset. Oh, whoa. Hi. Alice, you! You know what, Alice, you, you said something about this. Um, send me, I have, I have a bunch of handouts. Uh, I'm teaching actually a string chain music pedagogy course here at NEC. LSU was asking about the the uh, score study handout. I'll send you what I got, um, and I've got other stuff too. So if you want, um, I'm happy to share that. Um, some of them have pretty excellent fonts, Alice. So you know, I'm not gonna lie, the fonts are cool. Oh my gosh, Kile! Hi, Kile! Claudia, Claudia Duca. Hi, Claudia. Is there a way to perf practice performance? Any tips on practice performance in the practice room? How to mentally and physically prepare? It's such a great question, Claudia. Um, yes and no. <laughs> For me, um, the th there's something that happens when I'm getting ready to perform. And now I'm old and I've been doing it a long time, so it's different. But there's always an awareness in the back of my mind. Hi, Anna Bowman. Hi. Um, anyway, uh, and, and so it's, it's sort of funny. And I can tell as I get a few days within a performance, my, I, I can feel the edge even mentally. It's an awareness. So, like, uh, you know, it's like my body's like, did you practice enough today? You know, or no, it's, it's weird. It's there psychologically. Uh, also, you know, uh, I, I think I feel a level, level of tension or stress sometimes, so that I don't know if one can practice. I think dealing with the stress, uh, the uh, added energy that one might get physiologically from that mental preparation, I'm not sure how to get that uh, without actually performing or preparing for performance. Um, I will say that, like... Um, if you have things physiologically that affect you, uh, a couple of great resources to pr practice mentally performing are Don Green and uh, Noah Kageyama. The, these are guys, they're kind of gurus about performance. Uh, uh, Don Green, I did a couple of his seminars. He came to visit a place where I teach in the summers um, and another festival that I taught at. and having him going through a day long workshop about ways to prepare mentally to perform was really great. And he based most of his stuff on working with athletes. And then he mentored the wonderful Noah Kageyama who teaches at the Juilliard school. And Noah is a terrific violinist. So he was able to apply much to that life from his perspective. And he, uh, if you can find, and Noah has a terrific blog. I can't remember what it's called, but just Google Noah Kageyama. And um, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong. Not helpful. It's just not helpful. Uh, Nancy Kirsten Lube, and that's also. Oh, hi. Hi, Nancy. I'm right down the street. Oh, you wouldn't know because we're isolated. Um, yeah. And I can't remember. Oh, thank you. I'm an adult student of only three or four years. And this is helpful to me. Very glad the chats are happening. Michelle Kupes, I'm sure I'm saying your name incorrectly. But yeah, you can thank Paul Katz for that. Cello Bello is awesome. Um, any other questions? Um, there was another one. 
and I can't remember, practice performance, physically prepare, bulletproof musician. Thank you, John Rasmussen. That's what it is. That's what it is. Oh my gosh. Hayden, I like the cool little things you're doing, the little bubbles with your picture that turn into a thumb. <laughs> it's cool. Um, thank you. Bulletproof musician is, is I think, Noah's uh, blog. And so look that up. Uh, that could be a really terrific resource for you, Claudia. Um, oh, oh, and now Hayden's doing like the little picture and now it turns into an, a laughing dude. I like that. Um, dynamic key, the dynamic key, and a Bowman. Not at all. I'd be happy to show the dynamic key. Um, uh, the dynamic key, for those of you that don't know, um, I know I can tell you exactly when I started conceiving of this thing. Oh, that's a weird verb to use. When I started first brainstorming on this, um, I was, my quartet was preparing to do our first Bartok cycle, and we were getting coached with this amazing musician who taught at the University of Texas named uh, Elliot Handekolitz. And I think I've told people, we worked on literally every note of four of the Bartok quartets and every phrase of the other two. And it was very in-depth sessions, hours and hours and hours over a period of oh, a year or two. We had like a visiting residency at UT. So every time we went, we would spend hours with this guy. And he was just a delight. Um, Peter Saul's best friend. Come on, it doesn't get much better than that. And he, at one, uh, when he was working with us on a session on, on the fifth quartet, Bartok, said that the dynamics are the composer's emotional palette. And that really resonated with me. So I decided to, uh, on the plane ride home to start sort of free associating. What does piano mean to me? Do I have any other things? Is it sort of a general thing? So I started, uh, I kind of came up with this key and it took me a few years to work it out, but I discovered that um, I had these categories and it helped me in my own playing. And I shared it with subsequently with my quartet mates and it seemed to help us, especially with the Bartoks. And later on it would help us a lot with um, Haydn and Beethoven, but especially Beethoven. And um, and so essentially I came up with these different categories. And, I, and um, who asked about that? Anna Bowman. Um, I have, again, I have worksheets for all the stuff that I use, and I have one with some very cool fonts for dynamic key. And email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, happy to do that. But essentially there's, there's, a, there's the three types of pianissimo. I call one um, distant pianissimo, um, one's uh, an intimate pianissimo, and one is a suppressed energy pianissimo. And technically addressing those, so when I play, uh, a distant pianissimo, let's stick with a D, um, mm. a D tall, no I'm kidding, also a wonderful cellist named a D. Uh, so if I want distant, I will, a distant pianissimo, I'll go on top of the fingerboard and I'll really float the bow with no pressure and I'll probably use very little or no vibrato. So it's sort of a dull, low overtone sound, could be very far away. You can make it a little more hollow with a little more bow speed. And then if I want to make it more intimate, which is more like when someone's getting dramatic and they start enunciating and getting close to you, then... And then suppressed energy is that sound that wants to emerge and you won't allow it to. So then you go back to the flotando and suspended bow but you use fortissimo vibrato. And you don't allow yourself to make any sort of crescendo or intensification with the bow. And then I, piano, is, I, I call uh, singing because I find in general that piano is a very contextual dynamic. It depends on where you are in the piece. If you're playing Beethoven and you've just played a crescendo to fortissimo and there's a subito piano, you might play it like one of those pianissimos. If piano is the first marking of a piece, probably you shouldn't play it too soft, but you have to do it in relation to what the other dynamics are throughout the rest of the work. Um, but mostly I think if I approach piano as singing, I'm better off. I think I, what I've noticed throughout the years of teaching is a lot of times pianos don't often have enough core or singing quality, so that's helped me. Mezzo piano is one of those markings that, oh my gosh, Carol Tarr, hi Carol Tarr, are you in Colorado? Oh my gosh, Miguel Angel Salazar. Hi, Miguel. A big sound all the time. Oh, Miguel, 
Hold on. Let me finish the dynamic key. Let me see how I'm doing. Okay, five minutes. Woo! Um, so mezzo piano is a contextual dynamic. There's just not a lot of mezzo pianos written before like 1811. <laughs> um, and there are more and more of them as Beethoven got more specific, maybe even before 1807. Um, you're not going to find a lot of mezzo pianos in, in Mozart. Um, you're going to find mezzo fortes though. So mezzo fortes. Bye Mara, have a good practice. Say hi to your boysies for me. Um, so mezzo forte, I always find you want to sort of build sort of confidence in the sound. Uh, forte is not everything you got. A forte is a proud, a pride in the sound. It's got a, maybe more of a vivid contact point, and, but not too much bow speed. You never do a combination of the three techniques that you're combining to energize the sound to the max when you're doing forte. At least that's what I propose. You do that when you're doing fortissimo. So forte or fortissimo, it's just everything. So when so this question about the big sound, um, oh, I think it's over. Okay, everybody, <laughs> it just said cello bell. Thank you so much for watching this watching this afternoon's cello chat. Uh, in light of current events, let's read that. That might be really good advice. Okay, everybody remember that. Cello Bello is going to be holding all kinds of stuff every day for all of us. It's a great way to stay connected. It looks like tomorrow Natasha Broski's doing one. OMC. Watch that, you guys. Natasha's amazing. Um, so please, 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 everybody, keep practicing. Hayden, practice with your metronome. Do some games. Do some score study. Practice pretending you're playing in your quartet or your trio. And you guys keep playing the cello because it's going to be good for us. It's going to help us. It's been helping me. I'm actually practicing. Yeah, it's good. Thanks, everyone.